All right. Hey, guys, I'm going to jump in. This is going to be um, part two of what we kind of started out uh, with yesterday. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just not in a good place uh, today. We've got some really crazy news and stuff, but uh, I, I learned long ago that to, sometimes you just got to push through and do the best you can and do what's right. And so that's what we're going to do here. Uh, so I want to start off with the power of prayer, uh, part two. We learned last week, you know, yesterday, I'm so used to last week, but uh, we learned yesterday that um, God will do as he please. And we can't look and say, well, what has he done? Because God has performed exactly. He's never not fulfilled his side of the covenant. It's always been mankind that kind of dropped the ball uh, by way of sin and uh, just uh, breaking covenant. With God, but God Himself has always remained faithful, and therefore He can use His own word as uh, collateral for His promises. So when God tells you something and He makes a promise, you put your trust in that because you know that uh, He has never failed. It's a it's a trustworthy um, bet, so to speak. But uh, what does prayer do? Well, you can make a difference in what God does, and I think that's important. I think that's what we need to focus on. Yesterday we talked about we can't boss God around. And give him a laundry list of the things we expect from him. But we can ask, just like a, a father with his child. And do you listen to, you know, your kids when they uh, make a request from you? Of course you do. But it always depends on the attitude of the heart, doesn't it? Uh, if I receive a question from one of my children and it's humble and it's, you know, we're, we're on page. There's respect there. There's, there's love. There's, you know, it's uh, everything that I've tried to pass on to them. Then, of course. Of course, I absolutely listen. I love to to do these things. I I love being a dad, you know, and I, I believe my father in heaven uh, much more than I can, you know, even imagine. And so, of course, he will listen to his children, but it will be the same. Um, it'll be the attitude of your heart as well. But we can make a difference. And I, I want to point, I'm going to give you a couple stories, and then I'll give you the main point uh, from all of this. And hopefully, after you've seen the scriptures, the only point that I'd like to make will absolutely make sense in continuity with what we were, you know, just read. But uh, also, you know, if you get a chance, please pray for me. I'm, like I said, we saw, we, I, we heard some things today. I saw some things. It's just on the, it's just on Facebook. It's not a big deal, but it rattled me. Uh, none the uh, you know, all the same because um, there's a lot of things I can deal with, just like anyone else. But everyone has their trigger points and their buttons. And mine is when my friends get hurt or harmed in any way. I, it doesn't sit well with me. And my first first inclination is to attack. And that's never good. So I did, praise God. <laughs> Someone did it for me. <laughs> no. So anyways, we're going to get into this power of prayer. And I, I want to think about, uh, I want to look at two different examples. Uh, times in which God changed, not his will, not his focus, not his determination, but he did change his mind, his course of action, because of a request of one of his servants. And I, this is the power of prayer in, in such a nutshell, in my opinion. But uh, for instance, if you remember Moses as he's, he's taking a walk and a long talk with God, receiving the Ten Commandments, uh, the people got impatient. The same people that saw all the miraculous signs in Egypt, the same people who have uh, you know, committed themselves towards Moses and this plan that God has, you know, got them on. The same ones that after they saw the sea open up and made it to the other side, they looked at Moses like, why would you even take us here, man? I just miss Egypt when we were slaves. And uh, they looked at slavery with, um, gosh, man, just missing it. Uh, but it wasn't the slavery, obviously, they missed. It was uh, just when you're in the heat of the moment. I believe that's a very common response is to look back. But remember what the scriptures say. When you begin to look back, you're no longer fit for service in the kingdom. So continue to move forward despite the obstacle, trusting that God is with us. Uh, but needless to say, what happened is, and I, hopefully you remember the story. I don't want to read the whole story. But uh, while Moses is gone, Aaron is with the people, and the people get impatient. They just give all their jewelry. They melt it. And this is all by Aaron's okay with this. I don't know if they threaten his life, you know. Context, I just know that it was a bad move. And uh, God was obviously not pleased because they melted down all their stuff and they made a golden calf. 
And that's all they got. They got a golden calf, but they said, hey, this is the calf. this is the God that brought you out of Egypt. This is the God that, and of course, it was made out of gold, uh, symbolic from that time, also symbolic from our own. Uh, put our faith in these things. And they're bright and shiny and they take our attention. But here's what, this is the response God gave to Moses. He says, I've seen these people. This is in uh, Exodus 32, verses 9 and 10. I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, and they are a stiff-necked people. Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. I want you to think about this for a moment, about the heart of Moses. Why was Moses uh, chosen for these incredible adventures that he was on? And why was Moses the instrument and, uh, you know, just the, the one that would bring in the law and God's friend? Why? Why all these things? Why? I think it's because Moses learned to have a heart for God's people in the same way God had a heart for his people. We've heard often that David is a man after God's own heart. And we can see those similarities. Of course, David had his uh, many failings as well. Of course, he's human. Uh, And I think this is true also with Moses. Moses did have his moments of drawback of doubt and um, trying to get Aaron to be the spokesman because he didn't want to speak. And, you know, you know, there's there's we all have our faults. There's (laughs) no shame in that. But where Moses shined. And remember why he was kicked out of Egypt. Okay, he saw a Hebrew slave get killed by an Egyptian and he killed that Egyptian because he knew he was Hebrew. Um, So, you know, Moses has always had a heart for his people once he found out they were, in fact, his people. And I think this is endearing to God. And I say that because God makes him this claim. He says, my anger is going to burn against these people and I'm going to destroy them. But remember, I made a promise to you and I'm going to keep that promise because God's word is faithful. He says, then I'll make you into a great nation. So Moses had this incredible option in front of him, in my opinion. Leave these whiners and complainers and start fresh with a God that's going to make you into a great nation despite these guys. And instead, we see Moses' response. He, He doesn't accept those terms right away. Now, the will of God has never changed, but with humility... God's heart can be moved to go in another direction as long as his will has not been changed. Redemption of his people, things of this nature. And so we see this. um, Even though he could have left them behind, this is what he says. This is in Deuteronomy 18 and uh, chapter 9, verse 18 and 19. And this is just another, you know, just like we have the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Sometimes I look at the the first five books of the Bible as... um, rudimentary gospels <laughs> this is the this is the law the torah obviously but also they have uh, similar stories that you can find along and get small different angles here um, so after he does this he says then he once again he fell prostrate before the lord fell on his hands and knees and hands up in the air for 40 days and 40 nights i ate no bread and drank no water because of all the sin you had committed during what was um, <clears throat> evil in the the Lord's sight and so arousing his anger. Verse 19 says this, this is Moses speaking. Moses said, I feared the anger and wrath of the Lord for he was angry enough with you to destroy you. But again, the Lord listened to me. Well, why? Because we just talked about it yesterday is that sometimes your iniquities will separate you from God and he will, he will hide his face. He will not hear your prayers, especially when you do not approach him in a humble way. I want you to remember when Jesus taught his disciples to pray, Luke 11, uh, 1 through 4, the first thing he said is, Father, hallowed be your name. So you begin with praise. You begin with worship, not your laundry list of things that you need to get done. This is not just disrespectful. It's a lack of understanding of your role and God's role in your life. He's the king. He is the God of this universe. He is your father. Amen. He is your friend. Amen. He is your husband. To God be the glory. But ultimately, don't ever forget, God sits on a throne and you and I do not. Even if you've made one for yourself. He says, I feared the anger and the wrath of the Lord, for he was angry enough to destroy you. But again, the Lord listened to me. Well, why did he listen to him? Well, we saw in the, very first, the verse right above that is that he fell prostrate on the ground. 
He was begging God. 40 days and 40 nights of no food and water, that's called fasting. At an extreme level, only Jesus can match these things. But this is, he fasted and he prayed. And it wasn't just any ordinary, it was on the, you remember these things. You want to know why David had the heart for God? Even after his horrible mistake, David with Bathsheba, where he got a man killed to satisfy his lusts. Okay? Even after that, and we, they found out Bathsheba's first child was there, and it was close. He could live. He could not, even though Nathan said that this child was going to die. David refused. He just, he knew that God had the ability, the power um, to bring, to change all of that. And so what did David do? Well, he was on his knees. He was praying. The moment the child died, David got up and he ate because now we know what God's decision is. See, this is an act of maturity. That's mature faith. That's uh, that's something we don't see too often in our day and age. But here, I want you to recognize why God changed his mind. And he rescued these people. He listened to Moses because Moses loved God's people. When people tell you to pray for them, I think we got to take this into consideration. Sometimes they're not even in a good spot. Some of you, uh, especially I see the mothers, um, I don't know why this has happened to me over the year, but I always draw close to um, the older women in my church. Um, I've always, I, it could be a Florida thing. That's what people tell me a lot. I don't know. I have no idea if that's true or not. But they make sense to me because they're caring, they love, and they'll pray for you and their own children, even when their own children are completely disrespectful, completely disobedient, uh, have no desire to follow, have no desire to even come close, and yet they stand in the gap. They'll, they'll pray for them, and they'll they'll hope the very best, and they'll watch God change people's hearts if that's his will. But they'll do those things. I've seen it. I've seen it time and time again. Like when you're a young man, you're like, why are you even praying for him? Uh, <laughs> you know, you kind of want to take the opposite role of, of Moses. Like, hey, cut them loose. Let's move on. I guarantee God's got something better for you in store. But that's the way we think. And God even offered that to Moses. Like, hey, let's get rid of these guys. I'm still going to make you into a great nation. But Moses had a heart for God's people. When Moses prayed, God could feel his heart. God knew this is a man after my own heart. This is a man created in my image because this is how I feel. So this is a, you know, a, just a, another example of, of things about I want you to also get uh, another example here so bottom line as we can look at the end result Exodus 32 14 says the Lord relented and did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened okay so Moses was able to do that through prayer what's the power of prayer Moses saved the nation of people when he didn't have to Moses was his destiny his Sometimes the word legacy gets thrown out all the time. His le it was secure. God was still going to take care of him. But Moses shows himself to be the true faithful servant, the shepherd that he was, because he comes before God and says, please don't do this. Please don't do this. And he begs God for the lives of his people. And God hears this, he listens, and he acts through humility, through reverence. There's another story in the scriptures. I see the same concept and precept active here. Um, the king Hezekiah, uh, he was a good king. He took down the altars in the high. Now his, his child, the 12-year-old, took over him and rebuilt everything. But Hezekiah did what was good in the eyes of God. And yet he told them, um, you're going to die. <laughs> he gave them, you know, a little bit of a death sentence. Says uh, this is going to happen. He sent Isaiah, the prophet. I can't imagine that's good news when you see Isaiah come to your door. But he told them that he was going to die. Second Kings chapter twenty, starting in verse five, the Bible says this. Uh, but <clears throat> Hezekiah prayed earnestly, and before Isaiah got out of the palace courtyard, God told him, "Go back and tell Hezekiah, the ruler of my people, this is what the Lord says." The God of your father, David, says, I have heard your prayer and seen your tears. I will heal you. On the third day from now, you will go up to the temple of the Lord. I will add 15 years to your life, and I will deliver you and this city from the hands of the king of Assyria. 
I will defend this city for my sake and for the sake of my servant David. You see, God is always faithful to his will. You remember what he said about David. There's, there's promises attached to the line of David. He says, I'm going to defend the city for my sake. Defend that city, why? Well, where did God put his name? In the temple. Where's the temple? In Jerusalem. You see, God has always remained consistent. He's faithful. He's the same yesterday, today, tomorrow, and forever. His character does not change. It doesn't shift. He's not a man like us. You see, we're in him, but he is not in ours. And I think that's a big problem for us to kind of conceptualize and get down. Uh, when we pray to God, we're not praying to our buddy down the street. It's not a conversation like that. It's not, I think a lot of people think that they're having powerful prayers because they're preaching in their prayer. Um, I do this all the time. Um, I don't mean to, but I get excited. It's like watching a Rocky Balboa film. And if you know me, I've seen them all and I love them. I've got them down verbatim. I don't want to get into it right now because I will start. But uh, you start to watch and you get excited. Like I'm still watching Rocky movie. You're supposed to watch it and enjoy. I'm throwing punches. I'm getting into the ground. I'm ducking. Oh, watch out, Clubber. You know, I, I'm into it. I take that over to my prayer life a lot of times. And instead of being, you, you can see the, tier, the, the, the prayers that are being answered here in the scriptures where God is changing the result of history, where he's changing the result of what's going on in someone's lives and in the lives of the nation around them. The way he does that is through humility. Moses was on the ground and he begged for the lives of his people. Hezekiah was in tears, not because his life was going to end. Isaiah told him, and Isaiah, <laughs> again, when you see Isaiah coming to the door, you're probably not going to hear a bunch of good news. But Isaiah came back and told him, God has heard you. He saw your tears. We know that this is the way God operates. Remember the, inter the encounter that Jesus had with Nathaniel. Nathaniel didn't know what was going on. There was, you know, Andrew and, and uh, Peter and and the, the, the uh, sons of Zebedee, they're the ones that kind of knew what was going on. And first, uh, you know, but Jesus comes up and he tells Nathaniel, you're, you, this is a Hebrew right here. This guy's a man of truth. And he's like, well, how do you know me? He's like, I saw you when you were praying. God, through Christ, saw Nathaniel prayer, uh, praying. God takes note of these things. They're not empty words, brothers and sisters. They can be if our heart is empty. If we're putting on a performance, you're not going to impress God. God's seen it all. You know, you remember what he says about sacrifices in, in Isaiah. Like, I'm sick of these things. Your new moon convocation festivals, I, uh, my heart, I don't want them. Do you think I, I need that? Do you think I, I, I enjoy hearing the slaughtering of cows and rams? Do you think I enjoy that blood being? No, you missed the point. I want your heart. I want you to understand why you're here. It's not an act. Church is not a, a place where you come and you feel good and you walk out like you just watched Rocky. Now, that can happen. It does happen to me all the time. That's for sure. But that's not the that's not the point. And when we pray, again, like yesterday, we don't give a laundry list. We don't give a demands list. That doesn't even make any sense. That's not found in the scriptures anywhere. But we come with him with a heart of humility. And we should, just like, you know, many of you are parents, okay? When your child shows character when they do something at school or something and someone else recognizes say man this kid and they compliment your child because they see his character not his performance i'm not talking about how he did in sports i'm not talking about how he did on a test i'm saying they saw his character they saw kindness in them well that excites me and i'm just some guy i'm in the image of of, of god I, I can't even i can't uh, uh, you know touch and feel all the, the magnitude of, of the, the feelings that God goes through. But I can only imagine, and it excites me because I, I understand why God would listen to our prayers. You know, when you become a parent, you, you definitely understand a few things a little bit differently. So <clears throat> in contrast, some people will say, well, God doesn't change his mind. And they will misuse a passage and say, and I love to use this passage all the time. I hope I'm not misusing it. But he says, well, God's the same tomorrow, today, forever. So he's not going to change his mind. If he says it, then that's what it is. But we just looked at two examples that would just, you know, completely disrupt that complete thought. 
I believe 100% when the Bible says God gives grace to the humble but opposes the proud, that's he's talking about not just your average walk in this life, but also your communication with him. I, I think that has a lot to do with your prayer life. Because if you're acting arrogantly, I doubt highly only because of my human thinking, okay? I want to make that clear. But if if I doubt highly that you had a humble prayer, if you're walking around with haughty eyes, it makes no sense that you had a humble prayer before that and haughtiness was just the result of your prayer life. Two things have happened. You have a very weak, shallow prayer life. Two, you didn't pray. You just said you did. Jeremiah 18, verse 7 through 8, God says, If at any time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down, and destroyed, and if that and if that nation I warned repents of its evil, I will relent and not inflict on it the disaster I had planned. God does change his mind, but not his will. That's the difference. And it's a big one. I could go into that, but we'll be here all night. And I'm just charged enough now with a, a weird day in, in front of or behind me. I'll preach one of those lessons. I guarantee you we'll have young men falling out the window and dying in the morning. Have to bring them back by the power of the spirit. <laughs> Amen. But see, this is the thing is that you can never change God's goal. You can never change his will, uh, his desire to see people redeemed and saved. Um, but you can change some of his particular responses um, because your prayers are the prayers of his children. Now, again, I want to come back to your identity in Christ and, and, uh, don't hold on so dearly to your title. Um, I don't know what it is. Deacon, pastor, priest, prophet. I, you know, a lot of titles out there, I guess. Um, hold on to the fact that you are written in the book of life. Hold on to the fact that you're called his. Hold on to the fact that you're his ro- just holy possession. One that is cherished. One that is loved. A child of God. A child of God. Think about how you love your children. It's not easy sometimes, right? <laughs> But your love for them supersedes your anger every time. So God has this right. Remember we read yesterday that he does as he pleases. And even Nebuchadnezzar, a pagan, he recognizes this. This is the God he can do whatever he wants to with the powers of heaven to the people on earth. He does as he pleases. So even the enemies of God at one time, they can see the power of God. But you and I, we can't play a game. We just cannot, especially during this time. I appreciate what Pastor Briggs said this morning. Whoever has been stirring up uh, Irene in the morning, I think they got to they, they got to Liddell, <laughs> and uh, it was it was powerful. Uh, yeah, and Liddell's one of those pastors that uh, he will teach you how to fish. Uh, he's often we've had conversations. Who often will say things to me like, "Well, he'll show me something." But then he won't even expand on it because he'll tell me, well, now that I've shown you, trust me, you're going to see it everywhere. I think that's brilliant. I think that's a beautiful way to pastor. I, I think that's when you've given someone a, the fishing rod and say, hey, I could, I could feed you this meal. Uh, I'm telling you, it's going to be so much more satisfying if you go catch this fish for yourself. And it is. It, it most certainly is. So hopefully I've given you a couple fishing rods and reels today, a little bit of bait, something you can put on the hook and uh, go fishing with. So I just want to make this uh, clear. Yesterday we learned you cannot demand things from God. That's not the role of a servant. If you're going to serve God, you can't tell him what to do. That that, that just don't fly. Uh, think about your boss. You start bossing him around. No, uh, <laughs> even, it just doesn't make any sense. Okay, we don't even need to dive into that too much. And then here today we see you. Although God's will is permanent, it will not change. He's not like the, the shifting shadows. He's not going to be here. and that's He's not double-minded or unstable and all. None of those things apply to our God. That We're talking about his will. However, if you approach God with humility, you can change God's mind in your own circumstances, as Hezekiah did, and also in humility for the circumstances of so many others, as Moses did. This is the power of prayer. But we're not done. I'll see you tomorrow for number three. But I'm going to go ahead and uh, have a prayer time here. And uh, <clears throat> we'll close out. So I want to thank you so much, Lord, for all that you are, Lord. Father, you are to be praised. Your name is above all names, rightfully so, Father. You are King. You are Messiah. You are my friend. You are God, Father. You are everything. Ah. <sighs> 
God, the glory, not to me, but to you, Father. All glory and praise for you. God, I pray you use your servants, God. I pray you continue to use Irene, you continue to use Liddell, you continue to use Stephen, continue to use Felicia. God, continue to use Pastor Paul, continue to use Pastor Dale, Father, and I lift him up in prayer tonight. God, continue to use the long-haul preacher, Monty, Father. Uh, that brother is my friend. I, I pray that you would strengthen us in this time, Father, not for our benefit, but for yours as well, Father. That we would see that any comfort we receive from you is so that we can comfort others. We would understand humility. The Father, even as we pray for ourselves, we're reminded, Father, there's so many, they're helpless. And Father, just as you look down on the cross and you said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. You're praying for people that have you on a cross. And the small, small example my mind can think of is when a mother prays for a, a wayward son and refuses to give up on him, although the world has, and maybe even that child has. But Father, this is the faith you instill in your following. This is the faith that you give us access to. And Father, I believe it moves mountains. But if faith were so easy to come by, Father, it wouldn't just take a mustard seed to get us like, all you need is a mustard seed. It seems like, well, that should be easy. I don't see any mountains moving right now. But Father, I pray you increase our faith. God, please, your will be done in our lives, Father. Use us to move mountains in your name, Father. Move mountains for your glory so that when people look, they don't give anyone credit but you. We're forced. That's what I want, Father. That's what I desire, God. Give us such an answer that, Lord, it would be silly. It would look like foolishness, not just to men around us and women around, but to ourselves if we attempted to take credit, Father, for your power. For To you be all power forever and ever. Amen. God, it would be silly. We would be forced against our pride to say, God, to you be all glory. You did this. I cannot do this. You did this. As a child, it was your faith, but my faith is in you, God. The power of prayer is non-existent. The power of God through prayer is alive and active. God, to you be everything. Father, please heal us. God, I ask that you remove this curse from our nation. And I don't even think, it, I'm not talking about COVID, Father, just the curse of a lack of faith and understanding of who you are. Lord, I thank you also for a brother I got to hear yesterday. Um, I pray for, I forgot the brother's last name, Lord. I know you know, but Pastor Tony, I also am uh, grateful, Father, for the way that he took his time to walk through a lesson and could, took his time to teach a lesson and not just preach a lesson as well. Father, I thank you, Lord, for all of your servants. God, they inspire me, Father. I'm inspired by seeing your living spirit inside of just guys, just men and women, just men and women. Father, to you be everything, God. We love you. We thank you. We lift you up. We honor you. We pray this all in the name of Jesus, Yeshua, Mashiach, the Messiah, my Lord, my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, guys, I hope you had a good day. And uh, if you had a rough one, um, I hear you. I was there. <laughs> I'm going to go pray now, man. I tell you, just like Liddell, um, sometimes I laugh. I see him coming in and he's like, <laughs> and then he gets into the scriptures and all of a sudden, your brother's alive. It's like, I mean, you know what I mean? Uh, for me too, man. Just get, I needed a prayer time is what I needed. I was thinking too much and not relying enough on God because I feel... I feel light. Amen.